Father's Day to all the dads out there. It's so good to see you guys. Will you stand with us? We're going to sing a little bit to get rolling this morning. And church, it's so good to see you this morning. Welcome to our worship services here at Aspen Ridge Church. And uh, my name is Lawrence, and I'm the worship arts pastor out here. And man, after three months, it's so good to see so many of you to worship in person and simultaneously with you. I know that we have the folks in this room I'm speaking to, and potentially folks in our overflow rooms across the hall and downstairs. And and even though I'm looking at an iPad and welcoming everybody who's at home, and it's so amazing, we're so grateful, and it's kind of been an anthem or a, a statement of ours, but we're so grateful for technology that God's been able to use that, and we're unified in Him uh, during this whole time that we've been apart. And um, I do want to draw your attention to the worship folder that you know you can take when you when you come in on um, on these Sunday mornings. In that there's that communication card, and some of you know that. On a weekly basis, we encourage you to fill that out. Well, so many of you are looking at your worship folder online through our website, aspenrichchurch.org. And you can still view all that information in that worship folder, that bulletin there. And you can also go online to the contact us. And you can fill out your information. If you have a prayer request or a question or some information to update us on, you can fill that out in the contact us on the website. And that's a way that we can connect with you. So for those of you who fill out your communication card, you can drop it in the offering containers that are throughout the room and in our overflow rooms. We even have some offering containers for 
sort of close to the exits, and you can drop those off there. But even friends from home can fill up their communication for us. So uh, we're going to continue to sing and continue to focus on him. Let's just take a quick moment. Let's, let's thank him. Lord, thank you that we stand unified in you. We thank you for who you are, oh God. There is none like you. You are the one true God who unifies us, who binds us together. Who else is here? You are worthy of all our attention and focus and praise. Thank you for who you are. Come, let us worship their King. Yes, he has. I see what our Savior has done. I see how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, Church, we sing with me in the darkness. 
In the darkness we were waiting Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the world From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father Mark 8, verses 34 to 37. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? You may be seated. Well, welcome. My name is Mike Kelly. Um, I'm one of the elders here, and I'm also I have the pleasure of serving on the deacon team. 
Um, and that's really why I'm standing here. Uh, we have an awesome deacon team here at Aspen Ridge, and <clears throat> excuse me, and um, we have the res that team has a responsibility of of serving both uh, our our body of believers here in Aspen Ridge as well as as well as our community, and that service can take uh, many many forms. We um, are responsible for everything from you know, inside the building here for everything from the greeters uh, when you when you that greet you and say hi as you come in, uh, in in into the building as well as the welcome desk and the entryway um, coffee that's normally outside these doors um, to communion uh, the communion elements that we that we take together uh, every month and. Um, it's interesting, we also, you know, during these times, we've also been made aware of some counseling needs. So, you know, we're, we deal in that world as well. So um, there's, there's a lot that goes on. And, but a big part of the deacon ministry is the benevolent fund and the benevolent ministry. Uh, very simply, this fund is used to just lend a helping hand for um, folks that, for whatever reason, have gotten into a bind. And uh, that can take a lot of different forms. It can be uh, just paying for, for some car repairs or making a house payment or a rent payment or, or household repairs, uh, anything like that. Um, it's interesting that this fiscal year, which began September 2019, to now, which is roughly nine months, um, the Benevolent Fund has paid out $12,594.89, um, which, which is a big number. But uh, what's been really cool is uh, God has used the people here at Aspen Ridge to replenish every penny and more of that fund. So. Those of us on the deacon team that watch this happen every month are just continually amazed. And, and it's, it's a privilege and it's humbling to be part of, of that and, it's, and just to watch God work. Given that we are in some uh, fragile times right now, um, we're expecting additional needs over the next few months um, through the end of the year. And so if God maybe is poking at you a little bit to contribute to the Benevolent Fund, there's a couple ways to do that. Uh, first, we take a benevolent offering that's specific to the Benevolent Fund every month, at the, usually at the end of the service. Um, and that is on the first weekend of the month. It's, it's the same weekends we do communion. Uh, if you give online, on the, on the form, there's a benevolent fund that you can select um, in the, the little selection box, and um, you can designate it that way. Uh, if you just write a check to the church, that's fine, uh, of course, and, but you, you make the check out to Aspen Ridge and then write benevolent fund in the, in the, uh, in the memo box. Um, in, a, in, in advance, uh, on behalf of the deacon team, we thank you. We thank, we thank you for just being used by God. And um, it, again, it's been a privilege to watch. Um, I know. Well, I know we have one deacon, one other deacon in the room right now. We may have others, but um, I'd like to rattle off the names of the of those on the deacon team. And and um, those are Eric Krajewski. Um, you may know him as the director of, of uh, small groups around here. Uh, Ed Marcy, uh, Ed's usually a Saturday night guy. Uh, Carol Battersby, who I know isn't attending yet. Uh, Carol Reinold, many times she's at the welcome center, welcome desk in the, in the foyer when you come in. Actually, I heard from Carol this morning, she's not feeling well, so she's not here today. Uh, we have Daniel Sheffer that I know is over there. Daniel, if you'd give a wave or stand up so people know who you are. Um, and he's uh, also many times at the board in the back. <coughs> and myself. So again, uh, we thank you. Um, it's humbling to be part of this ministry. And um, we look forward to what God's going to do.
So would you pray with me now as we move on? Father God, um, thank you for loving us. Thank you, Lord, for loving us um, when we don't deserve your love. We, Lord, we humbly come before you as your people, and we, we thank you that we can gather as a body of believers. Uh, Lord, we want to honor you. We want to uh, pray for our leaders, our, our national leaders, our local leaders, our leaders here at Aspen Ridge Church. Uh, Father, we pray for your uh, guidance and wisdom and direction. Um, Lord, we pray for Pastor Jeff as he brings uh, your word, your message to us today, and uh, we pray that you'd use him, use his words. Um, Lord, we want to honor you, and we want to glorify you, so uh, again, we love you, and thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning! Welcome back! Oh, and happy Father's Day. I'm Debbie Stewart. I'm the director of Children's Ministries. And, you know, on behalf of all of us at Aspen Ridge, we are just so happy to be reopened. Um, over three months ago, I sent out a video to um, uh, all the families and the kiddos and the congregation and said, you know, this, this situation here with COVID is temporary. And I think we can all admit right now, it's a little longer temporary than we were hoping at the beginning or knew of or anything like that, but we're open and that is the first step back to normal. So praise God. <laughs> and um, so it's a little bit different though. Um, kiddos, I'm so glad you're here. Um, it's so awesome to see your smiling faces. And um, so for now, you're gonna join your parents in big church. And this is actually a really, really cool opportunity for you guys because you get to hear the awesome worship music. Wasn't it great? It's beautiful, huh? And you get to hear a message each week from me. And you also get to hear Pastor Jeff's message. And how cool is that? So I encourage you on your drive home, you guys all learned the same message, right? So you can all talk about it and debrief it. It's a really, really cool time to learn. And, um, and adults, you're being, this is really cool for all of us because you're really modeling um, what to do in church. These kids are looking up to you and watching how you do big church. So sing loud and pray hard and, um, and, and these kids are gonna learn from you guys too. So, um, uh, and every week kiddos, I will have kids packs available. I'll be right at the Welcome Center every single service and um, there'll be new stuff in each pack each week so you don't you know so you don't get bored of one thing um, but it'll help keep your little busy hands occupied as you listen and celebrate our amazing Lord Jesus so we are open praise you God for that and welcome back my friends thank you Debbie Stewart director of children's ministry thank you Mike Kelly who is over our deacon team. Friends, it is great to see you. It has been just about four months uh, that we have been apart, at least physically. I trust many of you have been connecting with small group life. I've been speaking into a video camera and with empty seats, and now I get to actually connect and see you and be with you in the same space and at the same time. Uh, those of you in our live stream video rooms, we wish you could be here. We trust that will happen in the coming weeks. Uh, also, those of you online, we've actually seen some gains, friends, in our uh, engagement with our community by means of our online presence, and we're so thankful for that. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24, in 25, it says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So um, we're connecting with the weekend worship and small group of your choice. Many, many changes. In fact, I, I want to spend the first half or so of my message just talking about how the world 
has changed. Perhaps how you have changed, and you can think on that. We'll talk about Aspen Ridge and how there have been changes here. We are regathering with some changes. If you want to connect with those, there's an article online on our Aspen Ridge YouTube page and Facebook page and website. Uh, this article includes guidance on how we're doing things here and answers frequently asked questions. I placed Pastor Craig Casteltz over the regathering initiative. There's a surprising number of complex things and he's doing a great job in overseeing those things. People are working with different degrees of confidence, comfort, and vulnerability with COVID-19. So the use of masks and physical distance, by the way, I'll be using the term physical distance, because really as followers of Jesus in a company of faith, we need each other. We need the social community, the social context, the social relationships. That is a very big deal. So I'm talking about physical distance. It's a personal decision. We want to respect those decisions. Masks are not required, but also not persecuted. Wear what makes you feel comfortable and honor those who decide with a different choice. We love you with or without masks. And on physical distancing, be respectful of each person's choice if they ask for space. This is a house of worship. It's a house of unity. And it's been 14 weeks since we gathered. God is as worthy as ever, and God is at work. We have learned that trials bring an opportunity for character development, for personal growth, and also public witness. Witness to our neighbors. Witness in relationships. We can fly a flag. We can plant a seed. We can share an account of the difference that Jesus Christ is making in our lives. God is at work. He may be using these events to awaken a new generation to faith in Jesus Christ. That's where my prayers have been. The prospects for revival, which is an awakening to the worthiness and the treasure that is God, and to the ways we personally have broken the heart of God by going on our own independent way rather than God's way, this begins with the company of faith. It begins with the people of God. We each have a story, but God has certainly been at work. We've learned afresh that the church is not a building. In fact, our mission is more important than ever, which is inviting neighbors to find a home in Christ. And I wonder if these 14 weeks have been a God-given interruption of the status quo, the comfort and the ease of gathering here among familiar people. We share values. We share an identity, in many cases at least, of being sons and daughters of God. And yet God has been pushing us, I believe, toward our community and toward our neighbors and toward our neighborhoods. I don't know about you, but among the things God is doing with my wife and I, is really connecting with our neighbors in, in, in fresh ways. We have about 20 new names. We've rekindled things with our neighbors. We're taking walks with our neighbors. I was just on the golf course about a week ago with two of my neighbors that we've been praying for for years. And friends, there's new opportunities in these avenues and bridges of relationship to share the story of faith. This is a big deal. Inviting neighbors to find a home in Christ together. The church is not a building. We also have missed each other and I believe have taken our weekend celebrations for granted. We realize that as we've missed the opportunity to connect. We see how vital small group ministry really is. So our small groups are more um, 
tactile, more flexible. They, in the adverse conditions, our small groups held up better than our weekend services did because certainly there were boundaries placed on us and limits placed on these public, large-scale gatherings. But in many cases, our small groups began to flourish. Uh, some of you began to draw near to a small group. My wife and I had the privilege of planting a small group with a young woman named Kayla Bell. We did a Financial Peace University. We had a number of people in a home. And we also Zoomed in or had individuals who were Zooming in. And so it was a hybrid of online version and those of us who were together in actual physical location. And yet it was thriving. It was healthy. I highly recommend that you connect with an Aspen Ridge small group. Our team had to pivot quickly to online weekend worship material. I think as we look back, we were a little bit behind the curve when it came to opportunities for technology. We are learning how to build on and to leverage some of those opportunities for the sake of our mission and for the sake of the gospel. We began to work with live stream technology and our elder team actually decided to take on a person in a part-time role to really own and oversee our live stream technology. And as a social media coordinator, Megan Bidwell is in that role. So Megan, we wanna thank and appreciate you. We really do. We've seen a lot of gains in our engagement with our community by means of online. Here was something I heard. I could really focus on the sermon. You know, that really encouraged me. That really fueled me. But what is it? When we gather, are we a little extra concerned about what a person thinks of us? Or how we're appearing before other people? And at least is a distraction or a temptation or could be that? And so when we're gathered in a place like this, we have a little less bandwidth or were a little less prepared, and yet what I was hearing as I gave myself to an Easter message with over 600 views online about has science disproved Christianity, people said, I really connected with that. That answered for questions for me. We did a series on coming to terms with resistance, and I rotated back after my sabbatical into Romans chapter 11 which is a series about end times. And I had people really connect with me. They want me to come to their small group and answer questions about the end times. We're in a series entitled Going Deeper. I'm carrying forward some helps and lessons I received on my sabbatical. And, and I've heard people say, thank you for this. So it does seem like this weekend worship material by whatever means is going forward and serving the transformation of people's lives. Our church family remained very generous. We shifted in large part to online giving. We were, I think, 10% or less online giving before, before all of this COVID-19. I believe more recently we are 70% or more online giving. We're very appreciative of this sacrificial, faithful giving, which will allow us to take advantage of opportunities to serve. We heard today from Mike Kelly and our deacon team about those opportunities as well. March giving exceeded budget. April giving was significantly hurt by the lockdown, but giving rebounds in May to slightly below average levels. And again, I just want to give God the credit for this faithful and sacrificial giving. So we've had anxiety. We've had homeschooling. Maybe it was in place before, but maybe it wasn't. And your kids are home, and you're a parent learning how to do this, and it's working to whatever degree, or maybe it's not working. But we have homeschooling. We have job losses. We have job gains. We've had financial reversals. We've had social unrest. We've had birth. We have had death. We've had gains. We've had losses. Our lives became very simple with a complex world swirling about us. We've had individuals come to faith in Jesus. 
Other individuals come toward us wanting to be a kingdom worker in service. All of this has been the case. And happy Father's Day. What a gift fathers are. They may provide protection, care, and guidance, spiritual leadership. God is our Heavenly Father, and He does these things. No earthly father loves like our Heavenly Father, but an earthly father can lead the way for his family by receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't presume you've done that. The essence of the gospel is that a person comes to terms with the fact that we have fallen short of the holy standards God has set for human life and flourishing and says, I need forgiveness that is found in the cross of Jesus Christ. So you put your trust in Jesus, what he's done for you, who he is for you. And so there's a forgiveness of wrongdoing that is one third of the gospel. Another third of the gospel is that I may become a child of God. Please hear me. There's a new identity that comes in a faith relationship with Jesus, a son, a daughter of the king, a new creation in Jesus Christ. You are new. You're a child of God if you've come to that place. So this is who you are. You're a new person. Yes, forgiven of wrongdoing, become new, a holy one. And a third facet or side of the gospel is that God has conquered the forces of evil and darkness. A great victory is won in Jesus Christ and he's designed you and me to overthrow the kingdom of evil, to expose evil and overcome it in the power of the Holy Spirit. So in the past, certain things have been accomplished for you. In the present, you're a son or a daughter of God filled with the Holy Spirit. There's a great future destiny in Jesus Christ and his kingdom will come. It will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the gospel. Fathers, receive the gospel. Live and model the gospel. If your father has not yet come to faith in Christ, give witness to your faith in Jesus Christ. Friends, we have a few reflections in Mark chapter 8 today. I mentioned we're in a going deeper series. We're in the fourth of a six-week series. The first week, we simply said, be still and know that he is God. The second week, we listen to the invitation of Jesus. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The third week, which was last week, Pastor Craig shared this important passage at the end of Psalm 139. It's really a prayer that God would search me and know my heart. He would try me and know my anxious thoughts, see if there would be any hurtful way in me. God, examine me. God, reach into my life and bring your truth. Let me see you and as you really are. Say the same thing, which is really what the word confess means in the original language. Say the same thing about my life as what you say about my life. And may there be truth and forgiveness and grace. And may I see the mirror, but ultimately your presence. And I have a true and sober evaluation of who I really am. This week, we go deeper into the teaching of Jesus, who has called his disciples. And in the verses preceding those that we read today earlier, he, verse 31, Jesus began to teach his followers that the Son of Man, which is the favorite term Jesus has for himself, must suffer many things, be rejected by elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, executed in the greatest injustice in human history. 
and after three days rise again. This, the event of the gospel, which is not advice, it is news. There's a death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is predicted now by Jesus himself. And what I call your attention to, which makes this whole passage pop, it clicks, it fits, is if you look at this word must in the English standard, maybe you underline that word, maybe you circle this word. This is what makes this teaching so significant here. The Son of Man must suffer many things. The Son of Man must suffer many things. Together, the Son of Man must, now we can do better than I said, together. What does that mean? Okay. The Son of Man must suffer many things. Now let's do this. Let's whisper every word except for the word must. The Son of Man must suffer many things. Why is that? Isn't there another way? Wasn't there another way God could draw and reconcile the world into a relationship with him? Why is it the case that the Son of Man must suffer many things? We broke God's heart. We didn't love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So we need an objective forgiveness rooted in a once-for-all sacrifice that pleases and satisfies the holiness of God. This is bound up in Jesus. Another reason this word must is here is because it is written in Psalm 22. In Isaiah chapter 53, it is written this would be the case. God not only predicts, but performs his word in Acts chapter 4 and verse 27, it says, This is all the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. And finally, and ultimately, in Ephesians chapter 1, this is to the praise of the glory of God's grace. This is modest, a modest answer. Certainly, this is in view. This begins to answer the question why the word must is here. But this helps us understand there is a single plan of redemption for the entire world. Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and Jesus Christ is the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. The Son of Man must suffer many things. Rejected be killed execution style, murdered, greatest injustice in human history, after three days rise again. He said it plainly, Peter, who is a follower of Jesus, not himself a rabbi. What did Peter do? Did Peter commend Jesus Christ for the straightforward teaching? He took him aside and he began to rebuke him. Now think about this for a minute. Who is Peter? On what basis does Peter presume not only to be an equal of the man from Nazareth, the man who heals, the man who teaches the great words of the Sermon on the Mount, the man who raises people from the dead, performing signs and wonders, Peter presumes to take his place as an equal or someone greater than Jesus Christ, and he rebukes Jesus Christ. Who is Peter to express such disapproval? And I'm confident it's bound up in Jesus' use of the word must. Peter rebukes Jesus Christ. But Jesus, turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, it's time for us to negotiate and make sure that we're on the same page. Is 
that what he says? No. Get behind me, Satan. For you have not placed your mind on the things of God, but rather on the things of man. Listen, this is a big deal. And there's a dividing line here that says there's the thoughts of God and the things of God, and there's the thoughts of the adversary of God. And Peter was lining himself up in rebuking Jesus Christ on the side of the adversary. And so Jesus will not receive a rebuke from Peter, but Jesus in turn rebukes Peter. And I say to myself, I want to be on the side of Jesus Christ. I want to be on the side of God. I want to be in line and subject to the teaching of Jesus Christ. I'm ready to receive the fact the Son of Man must suffer many things be rejected, killed, and after three days, rise again. And so Jesus teaches us how to receive the gospel. It's right there in verse 35. The very word gospel, which is good news. It's an event, not advice. In Mark 1.15, repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus could have simply said that. Instead, I think he's building out what it means to turn and to believe in the gospel. So he says this in verse 34, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? So there's a lot here, friends. And I can only just begin. But I'll, I'll candidly say I've struggled to understand this. On the one hand, here is the man from Nazareth, the Son of God, teaching me about how to connect with the things of God. And this is in my self-interest. We're talking about gaining eternal life. We're actually using terms of economy, profit, loss, gain. And he's actually inviting his audience to receive the best and the highest things in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. There is self-interest that is here. It is in your best interest to avoid the things of our spiritual adversary, to avoid simply going along with the thoughts of human beings in opposition to God. It is better for your eternal destiny to receive the things of God to gain your life, to have profit. He appeals to this. But he also says, deny himself. It's paradoxical. How, how do I put those things together? The more I've thought about it, it must be that a new self has come into existence a new self that is capable of denying an old self and an old self that is capable of being denied. So underneath and with these words is the miracle of a supernatural birth. Someone born from above. Someone born again in the power of the Holy Spirit, regeneration, that God, the Spirit is at work in your life, and there's a miracle, there's an event that you become a son or a daughter of the King. Have you come to this place yet? By trust in Jesus, by following Jesus, he makes all things new. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things passed away and new things have come. So the denial is of the old self, which should be crucified. 
resisted, rejected, denied. And the real you is a new self in relationship to Jesus. Take up his cross. Follow me, whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it or be saved. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world forfeit his soul. There's incredible materialism in the Western culture of the United States of America. This is surely a false allegiance and a false god. People are pursuing money and wealth above the things of God frequently in our day and age. I decided to look up the most valuable companies in the world on Google. Google may be among those, although I didn't see it listed. I saw Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, Facebook, and Exxon Mobil. Now, I can't begin to say the capitalization, the wealth, the billions and billions and perhaps trillions of dollars that are bound up in the value of these companies, the profit margins, of these companies, imagine you were a stockholder of substance in each of these companies. Imagine you had a majority position of ownership in these companies. Imagine you own them all outright. You, you had so much money you can barely even count it. You have difficult decisions each day. How am I going to spend this money? How many luxurious things am I going to buy? How many luxurious vacations am I going to go on? How wealthy and extravagant and luxurious and over the top can I possibly go? Imagine this describes you. But what ultimate and eventual profit, which is actually the language of commerce and economy, what does it profit a man or a woman to gain the whole world and lose his or her soul? You just had a temporary fling. But the most important thing, your relationship with God, is not substantive. It isn't rooted in Jesus and it isn't eternal. Or imagine, imagine you have popularity that a human being has rarely received. Uh, imagine you're in the spotlight, a musician, a country singer, an entertainer, an actor or an actress. Imagine the lights are filled with your name, the box office, which is lagging, I suppose, or movie theaters aren't what they used to be, but imagine on the screen, whatever screen your entertainment is, imagine the most prominent actor or actress. Imagine the influence, the prominence, the power, and yet in verse 38 it says, whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed. You could have the whole world, the adulation, the ratings, the prominence, everything. Your name is in lights, and yet the Son of Man is ashamed of you. It's fleeting. It's temporary. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Three steps of application, friends, from today. Step one, ask yourself the question, what must you renounce today? Have you been coveting approval? or material things? A 
ultimately we're on the side of God and Jesus or on the things of man or Satan. There's no way to sugarcoat this. Neil Anderson in his Freedom in Christ materials has step one in becoming free is to renounce certain things. He has a prayer. Dear Lord, I know how easy it is to allow other things and people to become more important to me than you. I also know this is terribly offensive to you as you have commanded that I shall have no other gods before you. I confess I have not loved you with all my heart, soul, mind, and as a result, I have sinned against you, violating the first and greatest commandment. I repent and turn away from this idolatry. I choose to return to you. Lord Jesus, my first love once again, please reveal any and all idols in my life. I want to renounce each of them and in so doing cancel out any and all ground Satan may have gained in my life through any idol. Now, does this prayer express the desires of your heart? It's in the worship folder. You have it. Take that prayer. Review that prayer. Make sure that prayer expresses the desire of your heart. Say that prayer sincerely and then be ready and prepared to renounce false gods, false allegiances. Application number two. What must you affirm today? Are you ready to affirm the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you ready to affirm the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected and killed, and after three days rise again? Are you ready to affirm your trust and belief in Jesus that you become a son or daughter of God in Jesus Christ and say, I am a child of God. And I will resemble Jesus Christ when he returns. If you've yet to cross that line of faith, let this be the occasion. Ask yourself sincerely, can I affirm that? And if so, tell a friend, I have received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. What must you practice today? Generosity? You ready to rattle some cages with your reputation and talk about Jesus? Talk about your faith? Are you ready to deny yourself the old person? That sin pattern and resistance and opposition to Jesus Christ and crucify that by taking up your cross and following him. Learning to approach your critics, learning to love your enemies, praying for those. that have such resistance, perhaps to you or the things of God. Father, I pray that you would lead these fine people, us, toward practical steps of renouncing false allegiances, objects of worship, idols, affirming our trust in Jesus and our identity as children of God and new practices in our life. Letting the security of our identity in Christ empower us to approach our critics. Many have came today prepared to give. We have containers to this end. All are surely invited to fill out a communication card which may express an available for service, a desire to be in a small group, here to know more about baptism, trusting Jesus as Savior and Lord. God, would you lead each person to the response in the communication card that you have? In Christ's name.